Contentment is one of the greatest things you could ever possess on this planet. I believe we all want it. I believe we're all trying to get it, but we might be looking in the wrong places. But does this make sense? Some of the poorest people on the face of the planet are more content than many of us who are the richest country in the world. One of the priests, when I was talking to one of the Kenyan priests, he put it into perspective. He says they don't live from paycheck to paycheck. That, that's what we do. Maybe more than paycheck. They live from hand to mouth. It's like I had never heard of that. But it's whatever they get in their hand, it goes to their mouth. They don't have extras. They have the bare necessities. And they're okay. And they're okay. When you pray the Our Father, we just prayed. I, I know you guys keep praying it the same way. And I wonder if you believe you're like, Dear Lord, give us this day enough bread for today. You're like, I want to live. Just give us hand to mouth. But your heart is, Dear God, please, Dear Lord, give us enough bread for the rest of the month. And the, you know, I don't want to have to worry. Do you ever pray that prayer? No, you always pray our daily bread. You're asking God, give me enough for today. But your heart doesn't really mean that. Are you really willing to accept that? We are, if you look at percentages of the whole world, we are some of the richest people on the face of the entire planet. If your value is about $67,000, so if you own a house or a car, or you, for most of your income, you're in the top 10% of the entire world. Some of the richest people on the face of the earth, and yet we're not content. So then we have to begin to think, Maybe if the poor people can be content and the rich people are discontent, maybe money and things isn't what's going to make us content. Now, I got to be honest, not every poor person was content, right? They were still hungry and they were still looking for more. And, and I can understand that as well. Having a little doesn't make you content. Being poor doesn't make you content. And being rich doesn't make you content. But we do need to learn to be content whether we have a little or a lot. So in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 to 13, St. Paul, this is one of his last epistles he's written. So you know all that he's been through in his life. He's writing it from house arrest. He's actually chained to a prison guard, a soldier of the Roman army, while he's writing this. He's been through all his tortures, the shipwrecks, the beatings, the whippings, the stoning. He's been through all of it. So at the end of his life, this is what he's saying. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. St. Paul was in house arrest. He did have some, some needs, some physical needs. And they sent a gift. He says, I want to thank you. Though surely you did care, but you lacked opportunity. You didn't have a chance before, but now you, you did it. Okay? It's not that I speak in regard to need. I'm, he just said before and, and earlier in this chapter, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. So here's this guy in prison who suffered all. He's telling other people, I need you to rejoice. Thank you for your gift. I'm happy. But it's not because of the gift. He says, not that I speak in regard to need. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned, I have learned to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer Need. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He didn't speak from theory, like, okay, you guys could be happy. This was someone who suffered really bad hardships. And he said, I learned to be content. And that's what we all want. When bad things happen, like to him, he was okay. When good things happened, he was okay. He knew how to deal with a little and having a lot. You couldn't learn. Let me ask you this. You're probably saying, Mark, if I had more, wouldn't I just be content? I mean, it's very easy to be content when you have a lot. Let's look at a guy named Bezos. You guys know Bezos? Amazon, you know. He's sometimes the richest, sometimes he's the second richest who just went through a divorce and he's still trying to go make money and worried about his stock. You have more money. You could buy a small country. Okay, you could buy any island or every island on the planet probably. Why are you still going for more? Aren't, don't you have enough? You mean to tell me with all that you're not content? Musk, I mean he's a problem in himself, right? Like, 
has personality. Everyone's against him. Everyone hates him. Everyone loves him. And yet he's also the richest guy in the world. And, and he's got his problem. They're not content, and yet they have more than any of us could ever fathom to imagine. And you know what they would probably say? Something is missing for them as well. They are still grasping for the wind. Though they have achieved the highest of achievements, yet they're still grasping for the wind. Now, St. Paul said, I had to learn to be content. It wasn't natural for him. And being content isn't natural for us. And you want to know how I know this? How many of you have kids? Mm -hmm. Are they always content from the age of two? You give them something and they're always, oh, thank you. You're the best mom. Thank you. Wait, you gave me the blue one? I wanted a green one. But she has, her pony has pink hair. I need that one. You gave me one candy, but there could be two or three. It's not natural for kids to be content. And neither is it for teenagers content. No, they're not content. And you know what? Most of us, it's not natural for us to be content. It's very natural for us to be complaining and saying, I want more. We're naturally discontented. So in order for us to become content, we have to learn. So let's try to go through some things that might help us learn how to be content. Because you know, we've all gone through hard times. We've been through COVID, right? Everyone was sick. Depression was skyrocketing. Now, COVID isn't as much of a concern, but now prices are skyrocketing. And we still have the depression. And we still have the anxiety. And there are some people who during COVID were just fine. And they weren't worried. And they lived their life and they were okay. Wouldn't you want that? See, it doesn't matter if you have the huge house, but you're dying of cancer. Or you have the nice car, but your kids are lost from church. Having those things isn't what's going to work. We want contentment. So let's go through a few things. Now, this is preschool. This is kindergarten. I'm not going to give you everything that will make you content for the rest of your life. That'll be next week. But, okay, first thing. I want you to, you're going to have to memorize these because I didn't put them on the PowerPoint. I want to turn our complaints to giving thanks. Turn your complaints to giving thanks. A complainer is never content. They always feel like they're missing out. They want something better, they deserve something better, or they're going through something they don't think they deserve. They always fall into the grass is always greener mentality. I know if I just had that or you didn't treat me this way, everything would be okay. Complainers means they're discontented. Just the fact that you're complaining means you're going to be unhappy. So what if we change the attitude to one of gratitude? The attitude of gratitude. So we're going to turn our complaints to giving thanks and our attitude to gratitude. I don't want you to say thanks. I want you to be thankful. We can say thanks and still have no thanksgiving in our heart. But when you are thankful for something, you act as if you received something. It's like Christmas. Everyone is always happy at Christmas, especially when you get things. You're like, a person who is always thankful feels as though someone in love gave them something, especially if you consider that person that has given it to you is God. That the act of love that I received just now, for those of you who have coffee, whether it be from HTC Church or from an outside facility, be thankful. Because there's so many people who don't get to have coffee. Ever. Ever. Something as simple as that. Part of the gratitude, and this is important, and I need you guys to realize this, it's not happy people who are grateful. It's grateful people who are happy. Happiness isn't having the things you want. It's wanting the things that you already have. Because if you're always wanting more, you think you're going to always be chasing, you're always going to have the discontent. You guys have more than most people will ever have. I promise you. You guys have more than most people will ever have. But, you know, your kids, they have the room full of toys, and then the toys are flowing into the living room, and then you trip in the kitchen, right? And then they're on the stairs. They've got so many toys, and they're like, Mom, why don't you buy more toys? What? Why don't you look at the... I got you the best, you know, race car or whatever, and you're not happy? Look at the things you have and appreciate the things that you have. I want you to, to look at this verse in Proverbs 14, 30. This is one that you need to highlight. So we're going to turn our complaints into thanks. A thankful person is always happy. And you need to be 
grateful for what you have, not what you hope to have. This verse is a landmark verse that everyone needs to know. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. I don't even know what that means, rots the bones. That sounds, I can't imagine it, but it sounds very unpleasant. Okay, so envy rots the bones. This is one of the biggest causes of being discontent. By the way, that's in Proverbs 14.30. Proverbs 14.30, if you can't read the screen. Most of our discontent comes when we compare ourselves to others. Oh man, I wish I could have been richer. I wish I was thinner. I wish I was taller. I wish I had a nicer car. I wish our family pictures came out like those family pictures. I wish we went on better vacations. And I wish, you know, our, our family was as happy as that family. And all of a sudden you realize you're never going to be content with what you do have. You always want more. But I got to tell you, you've been given your lot in life. Okay, God has chosen this for you. This is what you have. God made you the way you are. You are different than everyone else on the planet. God made you different. And He put you in a place, a special place, wherever you are. Why? Why did God put you where you are? Because God has a unique plan for each of you. Maybe you're not meant to live in the palace, and maybe you're not meant to be in a prison. Although I was reading a story this morning of a Christian who was in prison in Iran. And he was being tortured horribly. Uh, you can imagine. And he was praying to God, God have mercy, God have mercy. And God said, just have love. God told him to have love. So then he said, love. So he started to love the person that was torturing him. And with time, the person that was torturing him became a Christian. So you're like, God, I want more than just prison. Well, God said, I sent you to the prison for my purpose. And now, are you more content because you brought someone who was going to go to hell now my children, one of my children, is now coming to heaven. Thank you. You're like, but God, I didn't ask for this. It's okay. I sent you there. I have a purpose for you. Most of you don't look like you've been to prison. And I hope you don't ever have to go, at least involuntarily. If you go voluntarily, that's fine. To go visit people, that's fine. But again, God sent Joseph to prison, and he pretty much saved the whole world. So you are given your lot in life, and the problem is we're trying to live someone else's life. You can't live someone else's life. God gave you your life because He has a purpose for your life. He has a plan for your life. You are a reason, there's a reason you are in your family. There's a reason your house is in your neighborhood. There's a reason you're working at the place that you work. There's a reason why you come here and why you see the people at the grocery store. There's a reason for you and where you're at. So until you learn to accept that, and if you're constantly going to look at others and say, oh, I wish I had that degree or that car, you're never going to be happy. Stop trying to live a life that you are not created for. And the problem, one of the things that you don't realize is that those people that you envy, you don't realize they may not be content either. They might have those things that you want, but you don't even know if they're content. They just have the things. And those things probably aren't what's going to make them content. So envy. Stop looking at people. There's a verse that uh, is in Ecclesiastes, and this is, goes along with the next point I'm going to make. The eye is not satisfied in seeing, and the ear is not satisfied in hearing. Which makes so much sense. How many of you can walk through a mall and look at every single store and not get tired and you still want to look at more? Well, now we have this thing called online shopping. And you can go through every store and you've, you can, Netflix, you've gone through every single category, you've seen every single film, and you're like, I want more. What? You, you've seen everything. You ever, how many of you have gotten that sign that says um, you're searching on the web and you're like, you've come to the end of the internet? Like you've searched everything and you're like, that's it, I want more. Well, that's what we do with our social media, right? We just look and look and look, and you put it down for a whole nine seconds. You're like, wait a minute, okay, this is a, there might be something new. And you just keep, the eye is not set. So then what happens? Your desires, your envy grows and grows and grows out of proportion. That's one of the problems with something like pornography. Why does it become an addiction? Because it's not one image that satisfies you, you get tired of it. So then you go to the next one, the next one, the next one, and it grows and grows and grows. Most of our addictions is because 
we're seeing things that we want and we want more and more and more. So not only do we need to change our complaints to thanks, we need to have an attitude of gratitude. We need to be careful not to envy, but to rejoice with others. I have a great story about this envying and rejoicing. This, this story, I have got to read it to you because it's too long and I can't remember the details, but Father Anthony Cunyaris, he's He's a very prolific writer. He wrote a story about a 70-year-old Romanian Orthodox priest. Okay? He was thrown into prison by communists. His son died in jail. His daughter was sentenced to 20 years. Not bad, just 20. Right? His son-in-law, they were also jailed. His grandchildren had no food to eat, and they had to eat garbage. Okay? So that's, that's his situation, kind of on the bad side. right? Yet in spite of this, the priest greeted everyone with the words, always rejoice. One day he was asked, Father, how can you always say rejoice, you who passed through such terrible tragedy? He replied, rejoicing is very easy. If we fulfill at least one word from the Bible, it is written, rejoice with those who rejoice. So listen to it. Now, if one rejoices with all those who rejoice, he always has plenty of motivation for rejoicing. I sit in jail and I rejoice that so many are free. I can't go to church, but I rejoice with all those who can go to church. I can't take Holy Communion, but I rejoice for those who can. I can't read the Bible or any other holy book, but I rejoice for those who... I can't see flowers. We never saw a free... We never saw a tree or a flower during those years. We were under the earth in a subterranean prison. We never saw the sun, the moon, the stars. Many times we forgot that those things existed. We never saw a color, only gray wilds, but we knew that such a world existed. A world with multicolored butterflies and with rainbows. I can rejoice for those who see the rainbows and who see the multicolored butterflies. In prison, the smell was horrible. Others have perfume of flowers around them and girls wearing perfume. And others have pictures and others have their families of children around them. I cannot see my children, but others can. And he who can rejoice with all those who rejoice can always rejoice. So we want to turn our envy into rejoicing for others. Don't envy others. Rejoice for them. Wow, she looks great in that dress. Not like, oh, I wish I could have that dress. I wish I, what if I lost weight? What if I thought, no, just be happy for them. Just all of a sudden you're like, I feel good. I'm not jealous. I'm not trying to, I didn't miss anything. I'm just happy for them. So we're going to turn our envy into joy. The next thing is controlling the desires. Controlling your desires. If your desires are out of control, you're never going to be happy. And just like I said, with the eye not satisfied and seeing in the ear, it says, if you give in to your desires, whenever it comes knocking at your door, you're just going to try and satisfy. So guess what? It will continue to come. You will have this infinite hole in you that you're trying to fill with all these desires and they're never going to satisfy you. You can tell if you're satisfied if... How many of you guys love fasting? The ones without fish, come on. Okay, all the hands go down. Oh, man. We're not content. We're not content. But fasting helps us to control our desires. Maybe in the beginning you're not happy, but in the end you're like, you know what? I can do this. This is actually just fine. I'm not worried about having to spend all this money on expensive meats and going to buy this and fancy meals. No, I'm good. We're, we're, we got full sandwich again for the 37th day. But yeah, so it's important for you to control the desires. When you see that your desires are getting out of control, just cut them off. Just cut them off. And so you know what? What you have is enough. If you don't cut, and a priest used this example, cut it with a sharp knife. Because if your desires go out of control, guess what desires lead to? Desires lead to sin, and sin leads to death. It always does. If you let your desires get out of control, they will always take you to sin. And sin, according to James, says sin will always lead to death. Control the desires and you will be content. And one of the things you can do, because we're always wanting things, so you know what you can do to, to remedy the wanting things? Start giving. Start giving things. So instead of saying, oh, I want this, I want this, I want this, you know what? I want another burger. I'm going to try and find a person that I can go give a burger to. I'm going to try and, oh, I like that dress. You know what? I'm going to start donating clothes. I want to, I want, I, no. Start changing the I want for me to the I want for them. Start giving. All of a sudden, you're going to be more content with what you have. If you think you have enough to give, then all of a sudden, you're like, okay, I got enough. I actually have 
more. Last thing I want to say. Last point. Jeremiah 2.13. This is a, a very important verse. It says, My people have committed two evils. Jeremiah is a bunch of rebuke in Jeremiah. He says, these are the two evils. He says, they just, they just did two things wrong. They have forsaken the fountain of living waters, and they made for themselves cisterns that hold no water. What is a cistern? That's a cistern. They build these things. They're supposed to catch the rain when it comes, but they leak. So in the end, it didn't work. But he says, but I am a fountain of living water. You have a fountain gushing clean, fresh water that's perfectly alkalinized and in perfect minerals, whatever. It's flowing. It's never going to stop. And yet, what do we do? We try to build these cisterns to catch our own. And guess what? It doesn't work. One of the things that we give too much value to things, too much value to things, they're not going to fill the hole in your life. Can they bring you some momentary happiness? Yes. Can they bring you some pleasure? Yes. Can they bring you some comfort? Yes. I'm not saying they're horrible. The problem is, is that we place all our hopes in being content once you have those things. And that's where you're going to be disappointed. Don't put your hope in source of satisfaction in things because it will never make you happy. I'm going to give you my vanilla shake theory. On Easter, where do we usually go out to eat? Easter night. In and out. In and out, right? So you haven't had burgers, so we go to In and Out. That's like a tradition. I think let's go back all the way to the fathers from St. John Church. Okay, so we started we'd go to so then what do you get? You get your double double, you get your fries, and you get a vanilla shake. Perfect meal, right? You eat the salty burger. Then you eat the salty fries. And the vanilla shake, it's pure ice cream, that's what they say. And it tastes like it's good, right? So you drink the vanilla shake and guess what? You're more thirsty. What? It didn't satisfy your thirst. It, it looks like a drink. It looks like it, but it doesn't. All of a sudden, it makes you more thirsty. We all go through this. You keep trying to satisfy your thirst with something that cannot satisfy your thirst. The problem is we're forsaking the one. And if you have a choice of these two, the living waters or the cistern, what are we choosing? Unfortunately, we're oftentimes choosing the broken cistern. And St. Paul says, I figured out the secret to being content. I've learned. He says, I can learn to be hungry. I can learn to be full. He says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. His satisfaction, Jesus Christ filled him. Not only filled him, but overflowed from him. He was so full. He was over. Can you be over content? I think he was over content. He was like full to the point where in the same, chap in the same epistle in chapter 3, he says, listen, I was a Jew of the Jews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumscribed on the eighth day. I was educated under the highest. I had education and I had honor and holiness and all this stuff and everyone admired me. And he says, guess what? I count it as rubbish. I count it as rubbish. Rubbish, you know, we think of things we throw. It's actually like cow poop. It's like I think of it as like that's what I think of it. It's garbage. All the things that we're thinking, he says, I would give it all up for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And in Philippians 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, that's what he's talking about. He says, Jesus Christ satisfies me. I can sit in a prison and I can tell others to rejoice because I truly am happy. What do you have in a prison? Do you have a nice couch? Do you have a nice bed? Do you have fancy? No. What do you have? I've got Jesus Christ. I've got Jesus Christ. When was the last time you went to the Bible? You had a quiet time in the morning and you read the Bible and you came out and all of a sudden everything became beautiful. All of a sudden you were just filled with such joy and love like everything bad just went away. Or when was the last time you went to a liturgy, you were so full and then they said there's no Orban and you're like, you know what, I'm okay. I'm okay. That never happens, right? Like, are we so filled with Christ, so content that the other things don't bother us. The problem is that Jesus Christ can be our satisfaction, but we're forsaking the fountain of living waters and going for what? Broken cisterns that hold no water so you remain thirsty. One of the fathers, he says, when people are empty of Christ, a thousand and one other things come and fill them up. 
We try to get filled, but what enters in is jealousies, which is the envy, hatred, boredom, because you always want more, you go, oh, I could be doing something, melancholy, which is sadness, resentment, a worldly outlook, worldly pressures. Try to fill your soul with Christ so that it's not empty. And then I thought this was great, that the only one who can truly satisfy the human heart is the one who made it. Jesus Christ made it in such a way that He can be the only one that fills it. I don't know if you've ever heard this idea that you have a God-shaped hole in your heart and the only one that can fill the God-shaped hole is God. It's amazing. There, how does a hermit live as a hermit in the middle of the hottest desert with nothing but some bala, dates? What? How could you... No, I've got more than enough. I've got... Why? Because I've got... Jesus Christ. I think we're looking for our satisfaction in all the wrong places. If you learn to be content with Jesus Christ. So then the last thing I want to tell you is this. I want this to be your prayer. Every morning. Every morning, just this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, be my source of satisfaction. Be my source of contentment. Can you say that? Dear Jesus, be my source of joy. Be my source of satisfaction. Be my contentment. That's it. That's all I want you to say. Every day, God, you be my joy and let it happen. But don't ignore him. Say, be my joy, and then you go to like the mall, and you're like, okay, God, be my joy when I go to this store. No, this restaurant. No. God, I need your joy, but you got to give him a chance to be your joy. Okay? So I pray that... Last, last thing. I don't know why it's going to the side, but in, in Luke 10, uh, 41 to 42, Christ is going to visit Mar Mary and Martha. And what's the problem? Martha is busy doing all the other things and all of a sudden, Jesus Christ is out there. What is she doing? She's forsaking Jesus Christ, and she's worried about all the other things. So Christ says to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen the good part. I pray that you would also begin to choose the good part, to sit at Christ's feet, open the Bible, without stress, without when you're not rushed, when you have a perfect time, come to the liturgy early. And if you can, come in the middle of the week when there's no uh, distractions, a lot less kids, and you can just take your time and just be filled with Him, and you will be content. May God fill your lives with Himself, and may you guys try and the true source of happiness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Master and our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, you saw our needs and you saw our hunger. And you saw that our hunger was for you. I thank you, dear Lord, but you didn't hold yourself back, but you came and you became bread. You satisfied our hunger. You satisfied our thirst. You offer yourself to us, but dear Lord, I ask for your mercy and your forgiveness because so many times we refused you and we chose sad things things that don't really satisfy. I know that your plan isn't for us to live in sorrow. Your plan is for us to be in joy. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help to change our minds. We are more blessed with so many things than so many others on the earth. I thank you for all the things we do have. Help us, Lord, to enjoy the gifts you've given us, your blessings that come from above that are brand new every single day. I thank you, dear Lord, for dying on the cross, for giving us your spirit, for giving us a taste of the heavenly things, for giving us homes, cars, and all that stuff. But I thank you, dear Lord, for being able and willing to fill the void in our hearts. I pray for all those who live in depression, for those who live in anxiety, for those who are constantly wanting and are always missing something. Help us, O Lord, to stop chasing the wind. But sometimes I pray that the spirit, the wind of the spirit, would just blow us over and fill us. Bless this group, all those who couldn't be here, be with the retreat. May them come home safely. In your precious name we pray. Through the session of St. Mary and all your saints who are always contented with just having you. Hear us when we say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a good week. A joyful week. Have a joyful week. Yeah.